This meeting is now being recorded. Uh, we're very lucky today to have uh, one of the leading practitioners of geolocation uh, talking to us. This is a, a new area that uh, I have found very interesting but don't know a lot about in detail. So uh, Dave Schmerler from, uh, from Monterey is going to be telling us how he does this kind of thing. So David, please. Yeah, uh, thanks. Um, so primarily, thanks for, um, I guess, um, showing Uh-oh, uh, we're not hearing you, David. Oh, can you hear me now? Yes, there we go. Okay, I'm sorry. Yeah, so uh, thanks, everyone, for uh, showing up. I, I appreciate it. Hopefully, um, you know, you walk away with something. Um, you can all see my cursor move, hopefully. Um, so, yeah, essentially, mm -hmm. geolocation, if you don't know, but I'm sure you do because you're here, um, is when you're taking ground source imagery or video and you're trying to use um, other sorts of medium to figure out exactly where photos were taken. And we often uh, do this when the location is not named. Uh, sometimes we do this when there is a named location, but we just want to verify that the uh, associated location with images or other digital media matches up with um, the story being presented by whoever is giving you that I um, clearly do this the most is with North Korea because the North Koreans don't usually tell us where activities are happening. Um, I also do this with Iran and other places in China and Russia as well, but North Korea is kind of the you know, main focus of my uh, yeah, attention. So, um, uh, David, you're fading in a little, you're fading in a little bit of, uh, in and out, if you can. I'm sorry. Yeah, you know, can, you, can you hear me now? Oh, that's, that's better. much better, yeah. Yep. Okay. All right. I guess I just need to put the phone right yeah, <laughs> in front of my mouth. Um, so yeah, um, geez, where was I? Uh, generally, um, the North Koreans won't tell us where they are. Uh, if they give us an image, we'll get maybe an associated name, and depending on how long you've been geolocating Kim Jong Un or Kim Jong Il or maybe even Kim uh, Kim Il Sung's visits, you, you can build up your own internal database of um, name locations and uh, geographic uh, places in North Korea, and that's. Kind of the the best part about using or geolocating events and and visits by um, the, uh, the leaders of North Korea and and people who aren't the Kims, of course, because you can do this as well. Um, you can do it with tourists. Um, geolocating tourists in North Korea is always really fun because um, you can look at archival uh, research done uh, before this was a more prominent, um, I guess, tool in in research and applying information in North Korea, and you can see if, you know, like now that we have ground source imagery from tourists inside of North Korea, whether or not locations that were identified in the early 2000s match up with what's actually there on the ground, and that's that's a whole other really neat um, thing. But um, I came up with kind of like a, a best hits list of geolocations that I've done. I realize now that a video is not going to work, so I apologize, but if anyone's interested, you can always shoot me off an email, um, which I'll throw into the public chat if you have any questions. I can give you more material to kind of go through and retrace the steps of work that I did or if you want to edit or, you know, kind of practice what I'm, I'm showing you guys so I can make all that stuff available. So the first one we're going to do uh, is finding the launch location of the Hwasong-10. So if you guys are familiar with the Hwasong-10, it's also known as the, the Musudan. We'd seen it, I think, since the early 2000s, maybe even slightly before that in the IC, um, and it had never been tested. Uh, it, it, got to the point where people were questioning whether or not it was a real missile system or not. And then sometime around the, you know, early, uh, you know, it was around early 2016, we started getting a bunch of um, missile tests, and they were all failures. Uh, and it got to the point where it was, it was looking really uh, bad. David, you're fading a little bit again. Can you... Uh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Can you be a little uh, bit louder? And <clears throat> Sure. Yeah. So it okay. was uh, looking really bad for the North Koreans and the specific missile, but we weren't quite sure uh, what it was outside of the statements being made by um, U.S. government officials that it, it was probably a certain type of missile. And then um, sometime, I think it was early to mid-2016, uh, we got one successful uh, test, and we figured out that this test, or we got information saying it was happening around Wonsan. So we wait, we hit refresh, you know, um, on your keyboard, on KCNA, waiting for the images to come out, and, and finally these images start coming out, and we get to see a picture of the uh, Hwasong-10, and uh, it's now a race to figure out where this event took place. So um, looking at this first image, and because I don't have a video, it probably won't work as well, but I can talk you through the steps of the images and how I associate locations with them. 
we see uh, Kim Jong Un with his back, you know, facing towards us, looking at the uh, Hwasong Ten. Here we see some, you know, sparse grass. We see a lot of sand, and we see something off in the distance. Now I'm not sure if you look at uh, pictures of uh, Wonsan all the time. I look at it, um, you know, a couple times a week using Planet Labs and other image resources just to see what's happening there. Um, looking at this scene, we can see you know, loose sand and uh, you know, loose grass. That automatically tells you you're near the water. Um, not a lot of locations in um, North Korea when you move away from the water look like this. So it kind of narrows down the search area to a more coastal uh, location. If we go back to the main map, we're probably looking right around here. Right, so you have this whole area. Uh, I'm not sure your cursor. To, there's a there's a something to, that you need to uh, a box you need to click up on the top right of the uh, screen. Yes, where um, which which the uh, does it show, it should say show presenter's cursor, something like that. Presenter. Uh, yeah, it says show. I, I have that uh, thing clicked. Okay. If you can't see it, then I'll just um, yeah, just try to. Yeah, it's not. It's unfortunately not showing up. I'm not sure why. Anyway, okay. go ahead. All right. Well, we'll go. We'll go forward. So we're looking at something on you know near the water in Wonsan. Another image we get is uh, Kim Jong Un. Um, he's you know moving his hands to show how big something is. I'm not quite sure what it is he's talking about. But you know we, we see the missile, uh, the Hwasun Ten with uh, the warhead removed. We see a, a vehicle in the back. We see a, a bus. With a blue frame on it, some chairs, concrete. That's not really going to help us out. Maybe the concrete would. But the thing that really helped me figure out where this was happening was we have this arched structure right under the KCNA logo. And um, we can see that there are two tones of white. Right under the KCNA logo, you see a what essentially is a, is a white out. And then on the top right-hand side, you see a grayer white, which is uh, the building material. And then right under that, you see another kind of like, you know, zeroed out, pure white um, kind of colored spot. So looking at this, my first thought was, um, you know, on the left side and on the top right-hand side, those, um, you know, zeroed out, white out areas are um, open air. Because what you have is you have, you, have, you have light inside of the structure, and then you have light outside of the structure, and there's more light outside of the structure. So if you take a photo or you... You know, record a video or something, and you're in a similar situation, you'll get that glare of, of um, light, and it's going to prevent you from seeing out. Um, the second thing that was really interesting is that um, on the top right-hand side, you can see that there's a darker gray curve, and then you can see the lighter gray curve right on top of the uh, end of the Hwasong Ten. Now, when I was looking at that, I was thinking that the darker gray curve was like a lip to a building, with the lighter uh, gray curved portion being the bottom side of the roof. So you're kind of scouring around for something that looks really big. It's open aired. Um, it's got concrete, and uh, it's somewhere close to the water. So that starts to narrow down your search area a bit more. And you kind of coast around the coast a bit, and you run into this right here. We can see that there's concrete. Uh, we can see that it's curved. And I was thinking that it was open aired, but I wasn't quite sure. I mean, you could tell the front and the end, and the back were probably open air. It's like a hangar of sorts, but the sides were the one that you really have to figure out. It's right next to the beach too, so this location looks really nice. So I'm looking at this problem, and I'm like, I don't get any you know, off nadir shots that show me the side of the building and whether the sides are open air. The great thing about Wonsan is that Wonsan's a popular tourist destination. Another great thing about North Korea is that when people can record things, they will. So what you do is you go on YouTube and you type in Kalma Airport and you just filter through some videos to see if you can get a glimpse of this building from an airplane as it's landing. And there it is. So you can see that the front and the back are open. You can see uh, the lip right there that's white compared to the kind of orangish red roof. And if you look a little bit closer, uh, in the video is nicer than this picture and videos we can't quite work with right now. You can see that the sides of the building are, are open to the air, so that kind of fits the mental, you know, uh, construction of the, the site that you were looking at um, with Kim Jong Un visiting there. I believe, yeah. So after I kind of you know, identified this structure as, a, as an area that I, I liked for the inside of that building, I started going back through the uh, time feature on Google Earth, 
and you can look at the building as it's being built. Luckily enough, you know, for us that they had images of that construction. And using the uh, you know construction period images, you can see those gaps in the beams, which are highlighted in uh, red boxes. So this is all starting to match up very nicely with the um, you know location of the event taking place. We get another um, you know I think it was a yeah another landing shot of this um, structure, and you can identify that the little lip right there at the end of the building is the lip in the red box on the left hand side. So now I feel really comfortable about um, where this uh, you know, staging event took place, but now I want to figure out you know, where did the launch event take place. You can see in this picture that we clearly are on the beach, uh, around the coast. We, they, we have an island in the back. It looks like an island, right? Um, you have a, the island has like a little tooth on the uh, left-hand side. That's, that's very interesting. That might be able to help us out in a bit. And we have a pad. Now, the problem with... Um, Geolocating this event, and this was also kind of reflected in the Hua 15, so the imagery wasn't re recent enough to look for the pad itself. So you had to purchase the imagery, and I just don't have the type of money to purchase whatever imagery I want. <laughs> um, so I came up with like a close approximation of the area, and then um, Joe Bermudez at 38 North did a really great job of um, you know finding the actual launch pad. So uh, you know we're gonna look at some of the features now to help identify where this thing took place. So we have the island with the little uh, tooth on the left-hand side. We have another view on the you know, right-hand, top right-hand side, where we have that island again with the tooth. Then looking at the orientation of the tell, we get a look to the left-hand side. So now we have kind of like a panorama of you know, what is around this launch site. We have the island with the tooth in the back, around the beach. And when you look to the left, you have a mountain range. Now, at first, I wasn't sure if that was a mountain range or an island, but looking at Wansan, that looked way too big to be one of the islands around the area. So I assumed that to be a mountain range, and I started looking for features that were comparable. So if I were to highlight the hangar right there in the bottom of the middle of the image, we have the beach right across from it. Right across from this beach, we have an island. Now, zooming in on the island, we see a uh, little rocky point that stands out, and if you kind of drop down a little bit on Google Earth with the train feature on. It matches fairly nicely with the type of feature that we were seeing from the ground level on the bottom right. Now we have to see if there's this mountain range on the left-hand side, so we're going to go to the next slide. And there's a mountain range right there. So we have this island on the right-hand side, the possible launch location in blue, and this mountain range that's kind of obscured by the truck, but we still get a bit of a, a view of it. And if we drop down, turn on the train feature, and if we look for the features in the image, we can see that you know while Google Earth's elevation map I'm sure isn't perfect, it's it's pretty damn good, and you know for our uh, purposes this matches up fairly nicely. So uh, for identifying the location of the uh, Hwasong 10 launch, this was you know very helpful. Now another thing that um, you know is, is really interesting, and if you guys have read on Arms Control Wonk, we um, geolocated the uh, site for the Hwasong 15. And uh, they're building a monument there because it was a very important launch. To kind of confirm the activity that they were doing there, I looked at the Hwasong uh, 14 launch site. And I also looked at the Musadon launch site, the Hwasong 10. Now, the Hwasong 10 program is notoriously, uh, I mean, it, it's, it's pretty bad. Um, you know, there have been reports out there that they've just canceled the thing altogether because they're having more success with another type of engine design. But I wasn't sure if um, they were going to turn these two launch pads, these are the launch sites uh, that they launched it on. I think it's the top left arrow is the one from the image back here. Um, to see if they turn that into a monument. And since we have access to Planet Labs, I can look at um, North Korea, pretty much anywhere in North Korea, uh, daily on varying degrees of um, you know, image quality from you know, sub-meter to three to five meter resolution. This is a sub-meter image. So I'm looking to see if there's going to be any monument construction there. There's, there's nothing. We're in September of last year. Now, in February, we saw two structures go over the site. And this was starting to kind of roll around in my head on what they were going to do with the site as they start building this beach resort, which Curtis Melvin's done a really good job of monitoring and, and publishing because uh, it's a lot of construction activity happening right outside of the airport. But right after this February 24th shot, there's nothing. So for some reason, there were huts put over the uh, launch pads for the Hwasong 10 near Wonsan. And they were taken down, and nothing's happened there. 
And this is interesting because it's nowhere close to the type of activity that we see happening at the launch site for the first uh, Hwasong, that should be Hwasong 14, not Hwasong 15, sorry, but the uh, first Hwasong uh, 14 uh, missile launch. Uh, so, you know, the fact that this hasn't happened yet at this site when this happened more recently means that they're probably not going to do anything too grand with it because the missile program itself was a, a kind of a disaster. And, uh, you know, if there's one thing, they're probably going to be okay not, uh, I guess, memorializing it's, it's going to be the Hwasong 10 program. And this is an image from the Hwasong 14 launch site. You, you can see they rebuilt the launch pad and they built a huge road and they put down really nice grass there. So this is going to be quite a you know, I guess pleasant site to, to visit if you're in the area. The next thing that I thought was really interesting um, for a few locations are um, the failed missile launches. So one thing that's really interesting is that North Korea, and actually it's not that surprising, but it's interesting nonetheless, is that North Korea does not give us pictures of missile failures. Um, they've tried in the past uh, with the uh, SLBM program, but after um, that program, I guess, started to take off, they had no reason to try to pass off failures as being successes. Uh, one time they used a, um, or this one wasn't necessarily a failure, but they used a, um, I think it was a, a Trident missile launch, or a Poseidon SLBM missile launch, and they tried to blur off the English and uh, make it look like a North Korean launch, and that was clearly a, a you know, fake attempt. And the other one where the missile blew up and they cut the footage of a Scud launch from 2014. Now. You can look at this and uh, you ask yourself, how do you know this is a failure? Well, first of all, we never saw these images before. So if we never saw these images before, it means that you know they were taking these on the assumption that it would work. It didn't. And they never released them. By the way, these are stills from the celebration concert for the first ICBM that they successfully launched, the Hwasong 14. Another way we know that this was a failure was that the first successful launch of the Hwasong 12 had a different paint job. Right. I believe it was in the parades where we see the black Hwasong 12 with a white paint uh, trim on the warhead section. However, the first time it was successfully launched, it was yellow. So when we were going through these stills, you automatically knew that this was a failure, uh, or the top two images were from failed missile tests because we had never seen the Hwasong 12 launched with a white paint job at, at that time. So here we have, I think, let me see, no, that was not good. Okay, we have on the top, um, I guess two portions of the uh, slide here. We have a launch from um, near the coast, and then we have a launch in a mountain range. And they're different launches. Uh, they also kind of stage them differently in the timing of this presentation at the concert. Now I'm going to focus on the one on the right, because the one on the right had a lot of really interesting images. Um, these were the images that came with the one on the right. We have on uh, the top, Kim in front of a giant tunnel with the Hwasong 12, white paint job, of course, so we know that one didn't work. Bottom, we have him, I'm guessing, on top of a mountain or some type of large hill with his standard setup of tables and the uh, kind of like putt-putt grass and his <laughs> ashtray, the missile taking off, and then him sitting on the ground in front of two mounds and a chair. And I'm guessing this is before, well, actually, no, it's probably after the test because it looks a lot brighter outside. So he's probably just you know, talking to them about you know, what the hell happened or something, trying to explain how his great guidance will help them in successfully testing it next time around. But my favorite image is the top one because we'd never seen uh, pictures of, of missiles and tunnels before. And you know, constantly looking for you know, basing methods and ground source imagery of how North Korea bases their missiles, I saw this and I'm like, oh, sweet, like we finally got it. The North Koreans showed us a freaking missile tunnel. Like this looks exciting. And after a while, I started putting the pictures together again. And I was thinking about, like, the design of that tunnel. And I'm like, you know what? That's probably not a missile base. It's not a missile tunnel. It's probably something else. So I go to, and here's a shameless uh, product plug, the CNS NCI North Korea Missile Test Trackers. So the great thing about this is that we have all of North Korea's missile tests um, kind of uh, placed on this uh, database. And you can look at missile name, missile family, so IRBM, I, um, ICBM, MRBM, SRBM, whatever type of SLBM, whatever type of missile um, designation you're looking for. You can also look for test results too to see which ones failed and which ones worked. Um, and you can figure out you know, where the general area of these things were, even though we didn't get images for the failed ones. So we go for IRBMs. I should have changed the test result to, to failure, and that would have kind of narrowed it down a bit. And then I get a couple of options here. 
We have uh, one up here in Kusan in the top left. We have the uh, one on the bottom left. We have one of the Puchang airfield. We have the ones at Shimpo. So if we go back and we look at these images on the top left, we see um, you know the Kusan 12 launching in front of water opposite of what is uh, probably an island. Now, we did have two missile failures at um, Shimpo, which is where they test their SLBMs, and one of them, I believe, was reported to have been an IRBM, but they weren't quite sure on the designation. So going back to this image, I'm guessing that the top left happened there, but the one on the right might be a Pukchan. And I say that because, you know, we have this giant, like, underground thing, and we have you know, Kim sitting in, on the ground here on the right, and He's on a hill that matches, you know, kind of nice to the things that aren't Shimpo. But looking at the top image again, I'm thinking, you know what that also kind of looks like? An underground hangar. So underground hangars are really interesting. One, because they just look really cool. Um, and two, because they're everywhere in North Korea. Uh, they're all over the place in countries outside of North Korea, too. But it's almost guaranteed that any large airfield that you look at in North Korea, you're going to find a large underground hangar structure. Now, it might not be right next to the airfield. It might be some distance away, but it's still relatively close. And if you flip through the images on Google Earth, you'll often see um, you know, uh, airplanes or airplane parts outside of the hangars. Uh, occasionally, you'll see camouflage netting over the entrances and things like that. So this started to kind of pique my interest in looking at Puchang's uh, airfield a bit more. Uh, Dave, you're starting to break up a little bit. Uh, Sorry. Can you speak yeah. more directly in the microphone? Sure. <clears throat> so looking at the airfield, or looking at this image right here of Kim sitting in a chair, um, you know, people around him, moving hands and gesturing. There are a couple of interesting features here that I that I noticed. I'm thinking, you know, the guys on the left are in front of a giant wall. To the right, top right hand corner, we have another uh, giant wall or mound. Now, the, the interesting feature that probably was well, probably the most defining for helping me find this spot were the things behind the guys in the middle. So I, I know you guys, are, your microphones are off, but um, I guess you can maybe see that there are these kind of gray arches behind the guys in the middle right there. So it's like one, two, space, three, and then a little bit of four. If you throw this in the world's greatest uh, program, PowerPoint, you can change the uh, contrast of the image, and it becomes a bit more visible. So we have the red arrow for the first one, the second there's a missing space and then three and four. So if you assume there's one behind the guy in the middle, that's that's five altogether. Those kind of look like hangar entrances. So I'm like, okay, this this definitely has to be one of the uh, underground hangars, and Puk Chang has one. So let's look at the imagery. So I take that construction, you know, that kind of like mental plan, and I start looking at the different entrances to the underground hangar of Puk Chang, with the airfield, the coordinates around the image right there. And you can see uh, that there are five hangars, and they're arched. If you go to the location here, you'll be able to see that um, you know, prior to this image, there were only four, and they were peaked, and then they tore them down and put. Sorry, you're fading out again. Sorry. Yep. It's getting I, very hard to hear you. I'm sorry. I don't know <laughs> why that is. Uh, I apologize. Um, but either way, uh, there there are five hangars, and we have uh, entrance to an underground hangar that kind of matches up with the angle. And if we look at the image on the bottom right-hand side, um, yeah. bottom right-hand side, you can see that we have a uh, you know two mounds right uh, across of so A and right across from A there's another mound, and then B we have this like blast berm. I, I call it a blast berm. I'm not sure if that's the correct technical term for what it is, but a lot of the underground entrances are large complexes in North Korea that has these, and I, I believe it's because it protects them from. Uh, you know, ordnance strikes or bombs. Essentially, if they wanted to blow up the entrance to this underground complex, they would have to get it exactly on the entrance because anything in front of it would be a miss, and the blast would be, you know, um, kind of diffused by this giant mound that is a B. And then, if you look at the orientation of the image of Kim sitting in front of the people, you'll see the hangars, which are, you know, clearly visible from that position with the arrow on the image. On the left-hand side, you have that wall, which we can see in the image. And then on the right-hand side, what we see is not the wall opposite of Kim, but the wall behind him, this uh, type of blast berm-like structure. So that was really fun. It was kind of cool. You're, you're taking um, some older archival stuff with less imagery, and you're, you're applying context using missile tests that had failed and you never got images from, and you're applying that to other sources of imagery 
like Planet Labs or Google Earth imagery, and you're able to find um, the location where Kim was, even though you only had like three images. So you take a little bit of context, the images, satellite imagery, and you put it all together, and you can recreate uh, the events, or at least certain parts of the events as they showed it. This is another one from the uh, successful ICBM test uh, concert. Here we have two um, kind of tra uh, cranes, truck cranes. We have Kim Jong Un in all black. Um, we have a missile on top. It could be the Pukuk Song One or the Pukuk Song Two. Uh, I guess I'll spoil it and tell everyone that's the Pukuk Song Two, not the SLBM. And we have a, a canister and a stand. Uh, we have a small concrete platform below it, and a bunch of people kind of just standing around doing nothing as they load this thing into the canister. This is an injection test canister. Um, they, when you're developing a cold launch system, we, we first saw this for North Korea's SLBM, you start testing the ejection me uh, mechanism to make sure that it comes out of the submarine, right? You don't want to just, you know, like test a SLBM in a submarine without testing the ejection process. So first you test it on land. Then you test it in the water. Uh, for the North Koreans, they have a online uh, test canister like this, and then they also have a... Uh, towed underwater launch platform that looks very similar to the ones that the Russians used early on in their SLBM program. And that's where they test it in the water. Now for the Pukuk Sang 2, they don't have to test it in the water because it's not going in the water. It's a uh, tracked uh, tell, and they're just going to have to eject it on land and see if it works. So, you know, notionally it kind of makes sense that they would do this, um, again, for the ejection mechanism for the Pukuk Sang 2, because while it's a similar system, it is ultimately different. It's not a submarine, right? Essentially, it's a, it's a tank with a missile strapped to the back. Um, side by side, we look at this again, and on the left-hand side, we have our first ground image of the ejection test canister from uh, Shimpo. We'd never seen this before from the ground. On the right-hand side of the image, you can see the black little you know, half-curved uh, nose cone tip of the, um, I guess, SLBM Sabo or dummy that they had just ejected. So this is post the test Kim went to go visit. But this image does not match up with the image on the right. Because the, on the image on the right, um, there are hills, or on the left, there are hills, and if you look at satellite imagery, you can kind of mentally put together what the ground view would look like from Shimpo. And there's no way you could get that ground view and have it look like the image on the right. So I'm wondering, you know, where is this other ejection test canister? Where else in the country are they doing uh, ejection tests? Once you figure that out, you can start to monitor that type of activity as well. Oh, I went back to the place where they tested the uh, uh, Pukuk Song 2. And when you look back there, um, the 38 North pointed this out, although uh, it was a little bit different of a, a conclusion on my half, uh, but they didn't have the ground imagery as well. So that kind of helped me out a bit. We have this structure right here in the white box. So we switched to a different source of imagery. We try to figure out what it is. Well, to see if it's an injection canister, it has to have been there. It has to have had been there for a long time. So using uh, the awesome images from SkySat, from, uh, Planet Labs, we can go from uh, May to October of uh, 2017, and you can see that the structure is still there. So you know, while the quality of the image is slightly different, uh, the structure is permanent. So it can't be anything that's that's mobile. It's not going to be uh, uh, the, the, the like a tank tell on a platform, you know, waiting to launch or something. It's not a launch platform. This is. You know, definitely something that is more um, you know, concrete and in place. So we get a nice higher res satellite image of this site. And this is starting to look a lot like the test canister at Chimpo. So in the center we have the uh, you know, kind of a structure, the terrace structure that holds the canister opposite to the south, or not really the south, but below it on um, the orientation of the image. You'll see a uh, rectangle with a divot in it. Now when they eject the um, dummy SLBM of sorts, what they do is they have like a mitt, like a earthen mitt, you know, loose soil to, to catch the dummy so that they can study it and see, you know, kind of how it crumpled or whatnot once after they eject it. Another interesting thing that they don't have at Shimpo, um, and there's an obvious reason for this, is right to, to the right of this test can, uh, stand, we have a um, kind of a mound with like two rails on it, and then we have that same earthen uh, mound right opposite of it with a little divot below. Now, my uh, thinking on this is that this is a, another way to do ejection testing, but instead of doing it from the canister, they did it from the tell. So they will take the uh, track tell, bring it up on this hill, uh, I guess 
back it up, if you would, and then they'll eject it and, you know, study it that way as well. So, you know, because they don't have to do it underwater, they'd have to do it from the test platform itself. So you have two locations for doing ejection test stands. Um, and looking at that one image we had of that, uh, let's see here, where is it? That one image that we had here, you know, understanding that this isn't Shimpo, you can identify another place on the opposite of the country where they're doing similar testing processes. Once you figure that out, you can monitor that site um, depending on your access to satellite imagery. And if you notice, um, you won't notice this now, but if you get a high-res image like this one and you notice that the divots are changing or if they're filling them in, you can actually monitor whether or not they're doing ejection testing. So um, the question is, why is that important? Well, if you can monitor whether or not they're doing ejection testing, then you can you know, kind of get an idea of what's going on in their you know, uh, cold launch solid fuel missile program. Since they've already ejection tested the Pukuk Sang 2, um, you know, and they've said that they've notionally deployed it because it's you know, notionally battle ready, if we start to see test, uh, ejection testing again, I highly doubt it's going to be for the Pukuk Sang 2. So keeping an eye on this location will kind of give us a useful insight in, as to whether or not North Korea is doing ejection testing again. And if they are, that means it's probably for another type of missile system that uses the same launch mechanism. Right, so that, that's that's very helpful. Uh, another great point for geolocating stuff. Here's a side-by-side -side comparison. On the left-hand side, we have the ejection test canister uh, from uh, the Kusang area, and then on the right-hand side, we have the one from Shimpo. While they're not exactly the same, the notional layout is, is almost identical. You have a concrete pad, you have a, a tower with that unique U shape on the top where they put the canister, and then opposite of that, you have like an earthen mitt or a mound to kind of catch and absorb the you know, dummy that you're rejecting. You can also see the little divot on the right and the trail where they drag all the parts out. And then uh, the second to the last thing that I'll talk about uh, right now is um, other things outside of missile stuff. It's uh, you know machine plants. Uh, so this is the uh, Tonghung San machine plants under the Rung Sung Machine Complex. Um, I did this one as a kind of cold geolocation because uh, I was curious where it was. Uh, the video, which is on the bottom, which I, I can't show you uh, regrettably, but I will send it to you guys if you're interested, and you can try to repeat my steps if you if you want to practice. Um, it's an underground machine plant. It, it's really cool. Um, you know, it's a bunch of heavy machines underground and, like, you know, dome structures and stuff like that. So we get a video of this, and while I can't show you essentially what it does is a lot of times when you look at videos of, from KCNA of Kim Jong-un going somewhere, or Kim Jong-il too as well, not so much as I've observed for Kim Il-sung, but again, there's less video on YouTube of him. The North Koreans, whenever they move from one place to another, will show you a scene from a, uh, I guess, windshield of a car driving on a road uh, with dirt and grass and stuff, and those things are generally useless. I, I think that's just aesthetic, so you don't have to pay too much attention to that because that stuff has never helped me. But for this one, when he was driving up, we noticed that there were structures on the left-hand side. Um, there were there was hills and grass and buildings, and on the right-hand side there was nothing. It was that similar whiteout feature that we saw when we were in um, the Kalma Airport for the Hwasong 10 launch. Using the hills and the the buildings, I was able to kind of build a, a mental configuration of this being in a small capillary valley. And uh, the Yongsung machine complex is just something that I've heard often used when someone visits somewhere in Hamham, which, which makes sense because that's a large manufacturing and chemical work area. Um, you know, that's also where a lot of their solid fuel missile um, stuff happens. So that's uh, kind of interesting either way. But um, using the video, what I was able to do was to get the ground source imagery right here on the top right from the video and identify that with the end of a small capillary valley in uh, the Hamhung area. This is also, um, funny enough, if you guys remember when um, Kim Jong-un visited the uh, site where they showed the um, fiber-wound uh, solid fuel casings and the carbon-carbon uh, um, nose cone testing stuff, it was like the last big solid fuel that the North Koreans showed us before the new year. This is right next to that location. Uh, so this is a place that he's, he's visited multiple times. Um, but yeah, that solid fuel location from last year uh, is right next to this place that he visited in 2016. So he's been to this site at least twice in two years, relatively close to it. You can see that we have this monument structure. We have a big Juche sign. We have this thing in the back, and you see the two uh, white spots next to the 
top red box, those are the underground entrances. And again, um, like we noticed with the underground hangars, we had these blast berms in front. So if you were going to try to bomb this site, you would have to get it exactly on the entrance. Otherwise, you're going to hit a giant turret mound, and that's not going to help you at all. So we can use the um, kind of buildings on the, on the right-hand side to identify the buildings in the video. And then there's a giant red um, General Changu Nim general flag. So that was also kind of a dead giveaway, given, you know, depending on which images you're looking at. I think we're getting close to the last slide here. Yeah, so we can sorry, we can trace Kim Jong Un walking uh, into this building. On the top right hand side of the image, we see the uh, little stone uh, wall with the white trim. That is the uh, base of this uh, blast berm wall that uh, he's walking through to get to the underground site. Well, this is what the underground site looks like. So ultimately, when you're looking for locations like these, you have to look at the images that were shown before you to figure out where the underground production sites are which is, you know, really neat. And again, this helps you build, like, a better reference for where production activity is happening across North Korea. And North Korea has a lot of sites that look like this. So um, that's kind of cool. And here we go. My little kind of nerdy passion right now is to look at underground uh, radar sites. So North Korea does this thing that's really, at least from what I've noticed, really unique. Um, a lot of people will talk about North Korean missile silos every now and then. Those things pop up, but I haven't found any evidence for them. But one thing that I have found, and if you look at CIA's Crest um, archive, uh, there's a lot of evidence for this as well. Um, North Korea buries their radars in silos. So instead of missile silos, we're looking for radar silos. And there are at least three different types of configurations, and this is one of the larger configurations. There are two sites that I've found at the moment across the country. This one's right near Hamhung. There's another one, and the coordinates will be on the top, so you should be able to see it. Um, that are just really odd and unique and just interesting, and it's something that we haven't really gotten the picture of either. So I kind of love to get some more ground source imagery of this. It's my little nerdy rant for siloed radar, which just seems so odd, but they do it either way. I guess the idea is that they'll use this as an early warning system, and when the American planes fly over, they'll drop them underground, wait for them to pass, and pop them back up and see where everything is again. It's like a giant periscope for a mountain, <laughs> which is, uh, I guess, uh, pretty neat. Um, the other point I was going to say about this. Yeah, I don't know. Either way, it's just kind of cool, and a lot of people don't talk about this, so I figured it'd be neat to show people. Hopefully that will spark some type of conversation about North Korea's odd use of siloed, uh, siloed radar systems. So here's one of the uh, radar coming up. Here's one where the radar has been fully dropped into the ground. You can see it's empty. And here's a similar site. It's a bit harder to see, but the coordinates are up there. So if you want to just steal those and look at it in Google Earth, it's another identical site. Um, to the uh, far left and far right, you'll notice that opposite of the um, two larger early warning radars, you'll see smaller circular things. That's the second of the three types of um, uh, silent radar systems that I've identified across the country. So, yeah. And that's it. That's, uh, that's that's kind of my thing. So thanks for listening, and I'm looking forward to your questions. Uh, okay, <clears throat> thanks very much. Uh, so as I said, if you have questions, uh, either uh, put them in the in the chat feature or the Q and A. Uh, I wanted to start off by asking you a question about this last thing that you showed these underground radar sites. Uh, sure. In some of the other cases, you had some clues of where to start looking. Uh, this sounded like you were starting fairly cold. How did you ever find these sites? Um, so as a student, I, I got to know North Korea fairly well by hunting down the elusive North Korean missile silo rumor that doesn't exist as far as I know. <laughs> and um, when you start to look for those things, you start to notice certain types of defensive features. And one thing that I thought was really interesting is that you know, North Korea puts radars on top of mountains. They put a lot of radar-like structures on top of mountains. And if you get really comfortable using Google Earth and you zoom across the country at the right level and you put some time into it, you'll notice, um, just eyeballing it, that there are terrain disturbances on the top of certain mountains where they're not on other mountains. And if you zoom in on those terrain features, those disturbances, you'll have like a, a spring shot or a summer shot of a mountain top, and you'll notice that it's all green except for on the exact top of the mountain. It's a little bit dirty. It's because the North Koreans are building communication locations on, the, on top of the mountains. So all you do is put a couple hours into North Korea, and you can kind of float above all the mountains and start zooming in on all these little structures and disturbances on the top of them, and you'll notice that they're building military sites on top of the mountains. 
Um, so I first found this, and I was like, oh, man, this is really neat. Like, I think I found it. And after you look at some images, you realize it's a radar base. And then you go to the Crest CIA database, and, you know, you realize that the CIA was looking at this stuff in, like, the 70s and the 80s. Not this exact configuration. The ones that the on the Crest uh, database are, are circular, more uh, attuned to the type of silo structure you would see elsewhere, where these ones are, like, rectangles with triangles on top, which are very odd. But, um, yeah, I mean, that was just kind of a cold turkey thing. So. But are these uh, – so you said that uh, people have been watching these before. So you had some sense of uh, the part of the country this was in, or how did you even know no. where to start looking? Oh, I – I I just I was just scanning. I don't know if it's a surprise to anyone, but when I'm you know bored, I just look at pictures of North Korea. <laughs> so, um, uh -huh. yeah, I just started started kind of browsing around and doing that. I used the database for context to find out what I was looking at. So um, instead of looking for silos on Crest and then finding the radars, I found the radars and was like, "What the hell is this?" And then I found the, found out that they were just you know underground pop up really warning radar systems. So it, it, it helps that North Korea is relatively small compared to China right. or something like that. Yeah, this would be it much also helps that it, yeah, it looks a little bit different. Now, with China, there's a lot of um, really cool declassified stuff on relative launch sites. and I have to dig it back up again, but I did find one because they forgot to change the camouflage tarping, the, the camouflage netting. So I had a satellite image in, like, the fall, and the leaves were dead. Um, and I was looking at an area that the U.S. government had identified as a relative launch site, and I noticed this giant green, like bright spring green rectangle. And I started flipping through the images and I realized that was camouflage netting over a tunnel entrance for a roll to launch site. <laughs> so, uh, um, yeah, for, for stuff like that too. I mean, you can definitely do that in China as well. But China is a lot larger. makes things a lot more difficult. Um, the other thing I wanted to ask you about is you had a, a piece on, um, I guess, Arms Control Walk where you talked about the monuments they're building. Uh, right. Since you didn't touch on that here, I wonder if you could just say a little bit about what they're doing and why you think they're doing that, and and how how uh, frequent is that that they've done this with past sites? I mean, is that something you expected to see, or is this a, sort of a new commemoration? So uh, it was it was new uh, to me at least. Uh, I was looking at the launch site for the Hawthorne 12, the, the the first launch site, and I didn't notice any type of uh, celebratory structure put up to commemorate the events. Uh, we looked at, during this presentation, the launch site for the Hawthorne 10. Uh, again, that missile program was a failure, and we saw something pop up, and then it was gone, and it doesn't seem like anything noticeable has been done there. Plus, if they were going to, they would have by now. But, um, yeah, I, I hadn't seen any launch sites turned in the monuments before. And, and if they were, you would make it like a plaque or a small statue somewhere. But never had we seen the actual launch structure be um, immortalized in a nicer concrete manner than the way they did for the 14 and the 15. So that was that was something new. wasn't expecting it at all. And um, I think it kind of puts context into the, the thinking of the North Korean leadership on the importance of their um, – you know, uh, strategic weapon system. Yeah, okay. Uh, Stephen Young has a question. Stephen, I just unmuted you. Can you hear me speaking now? Yeah, hey, yeah. great. Thanks, Dave. Uh, awesome stuff. Question for you. I know some, sometimes you get images of the dual leader, and he's like in, a, in a, a, a new tent or behind screens trying to sort of screen where he is. Mm -hmm. I haven't seen that lately. You know, have they stopped trying to, to hide where he is from you? Or they, they don't care anymore? Or any thoughts on their patterns? Or and was that due to you, Dave? <laughs> oh, yeah, I would, I would love to <laughs> increase the size of my already large head by assuming that they did that because of me. But that might just be, you know, a standard operational procedure with concealing Kim's uh, visits and, and whatnot. Um, as, as to why they stopped, that's a great question. I think they started diversifying their locations a lot more. Uh, a lot of the tarped and screen things were taken uh, taken uh, at events uh, that we had already associated with um, their ballistic missile program. And once they started venturing out into the Kusung area and other parts of North Korea, we saw the tents start to kind of drop off. Also, um, they got a bit better at taking angled photos, right? So if we were to go back a bit, let's see here. Where is that one photo? Where it is? Not here. Right here. So in this in this photo on the bottom left, mark number two, like Kim's on top of a mountain, and you have a very foggy background with hills. I mean, 
good luck finding that. I, I think that, you know, for certain locations and circumstances, they don't really need the tarp. But let's say the North Koreans decide to do another salvo launch from a highway that isn't near Huangju. I'm sure we might see it happen again. Mm -hmm. um, any other questions that people have? Uh, the uh, I'm curious about the Planet Labs uh, imagery. Uh, the, you were saying that it, it, the um, resolution of those varies. What does it depend on? Is it just the so, uh, some of them Planet, are multispectral? Yeah. Sure. Yeah, Planet has like I think the largest private fleet of satellites in the world. They get a picture of the world every day. Um, you know, mm -hmm. uh, they have different uh, types of satellites. So we're looking at Doves versus SkySat. Doves make up the bulk of planet's fleet, and that gives you an image with a resolution of between three to five meters, which for people who are used to Google Earth might make me feel a bit uncomfortable, but you know, after a while, I, I fell in love with it. Um, you know, three to five meters is not your Google Earth material satellite imagery, but the great thing about it is that it allows you to monitor its macro activity. So let's say I'm looking yeah. at a site that I've already associated with um, being important to the North Korea's WMD program. I might not be able to see, you know, you know individual people or trucks um, or, like, doors open. But what I can see is if, you know, um, they're adding buildings or if something blew up. Like, if I want to monitor North Korea's solid fuel production site, all I need are three to five meters to make sure on a daily basis that they haven't screwed something up and a bunch of people died, uh, which would cause certain setbacks in their program. And, you know, we saw this in Iran at Big Gina. So um, that's kind of important when you're monitoring North Korea. Now, when you're looking for the sub meter stuff, you're looking at SkySat. Uh, I'm not quite sure what everyone else has access to SkySat is, but I have access to it. And um, the SkySat stuff is great. It's like a tipping and queuing. You can get three to five meters to see if something's happening, and you can call the SkySat to get higher um, resolution imagery to identify certain activities that you had seen. Now, we had uh, Will Marshall uh, on talking about the uh, Planet Labs a couple of years ago, and they didn't have the SkySats up yet, yet, so I didn't realize that. How many? Do you know yeah. roughly how many of those there are at, at this point I in the constellation? I think six to eight. Ah, uh -huh. so that's so, six to eight. But right, like so you have to. Like yeah. Yeah. So you have to. So you're not going to have great coverage, but with those, but it sounds like they're headed in that direction. So. Exactly. Um, yeah, it's great. Also, because if you have access to some other stuff, you can see where other people are looking, and that's very useful as well. Like, if there's something you see uh -huh. that you don't know, then you should figure out why you don't know it, and then that site becomes important to you. Uh huh. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Uh, Hamish had a question. Let me um, unmute you. Uh, go ahead. A little bit. You're breaking up a little bit. Are you, you able to, to hear me now? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Perfect. Yeah. So uh, I was just wondering if uh, your work on geolocation uh, has been significantly hampered or become uh, more difficult after YouTube removed a number of uh, critical CPRK related channels. It is. It is. Uh, it's. It's. Well, first of all, um, after the first round of removals, I should have been more attentive to downloading the videos to archive them myself, but I didn't. Um, luckily, I have friends that have done this, but it's been horrible. I have a um, YouTube channel with all my CPRK open source work kind of archived there, and it's been cut down to like a third of the size that it used to be. Um, so that, that's that's taken away a lot of valuable archival imagery and stuff that I still haven't had time to go through and see everything yet. So it, it's been really damaging for just kind of going through and trying to build a better reference point and geolocate certain sites between the three Kims. <laughs> were, were these uh, was this content that was removed by uh, by North Korea or, or removed by YouTube? YouTube removed them because I think they were afraid that somehow. Um, commercial revenue was going to find its way to North Korea, and that would be a sanctions violation on their half or something. And they do this every now and then, too, yeah. which, is, which is hard because if I find a new YouTube account, like I would love to share it and show people what's going on. But on the other side, if I do and it becomes too big, like next thing you know, all my North Korea accounts are gone. So it's uh, yeah. I see. That's interesting. Yeah. yeah. Well, we're almost at, uh, at 1 o'clock here, so I think uh, if – 
um, if people are interested in, in uh, getting links to some of these um, uh, the videos that he was not able to show, or if you have follow-up questions, uh, I'm, I'm sure he'd be able to uh, uh, answer the questions. Uh, if you need a, a, an email for him and you don't have it, uh, let me know and I can send it to you. Uh, thanks very much for this. I think this is really fascinating work to, to see that you can uh, pull this kind of interesting information out of what appears at first glance to be a very little uh, uh, evidence. So thanks, thanks a lot for this, and thanks, people, for tuning in. Yeah, thanks for having me on, and um, I guess I'll uh, see you guys all on uh, online or something. Thank you. Okay, thanks again. Bye-bye.